Jesus Christ tells us in Matthew 13 that we are to hear what he has to say. Pastor Brown has already read uh, the first 13 verses of this, and I want us to look at this quickly and I hope decisively and by God's grace, impactively, and I'm calling the message, How to S Hear the Kingdom. How to hear the kingdom of God. How does it really come through into your life? Well, in this parable, in fact, what is a parable? I think we need to get that definition down. Really, parable is from two Greek words, para and balo. Balo means to throw, and para means alongside. So a parabolo or a parable is something thrown down beside something else to give some kind of explanation. Here are the three best definitions of parables that, that, uh, that I have been drawn to. Number one, a parable is an illustration of a spiritual truth in the form of a story. I'm going to end my sermon today with a parable, a story that ought to have practical truth. Another definition, it's some familiar thing of earth is placed alongside some mysterious thing of heaven. And God constantly wants us to see in every human situation the divine situation. How do you really hear or see the kingdom? You have a plowed heart. You look for truth. And you obey what the truth tells you to do, see? That's how you enter into the kingdom. Remember last week or two weeks ago in that series I did that what is the kingdom of God? When Jesus Christ comes to establish his kingdom, two things will take place. Number one, evil will be removed. Righteousness shall reign. And the more you and I remove evil from our lives, and the more we let God reign in our hearts right now, then we're in the kingdom right now. The rule and the will and the wisdom of God. America is drowning in facts. We're drowning in knowledge. We're drowning in the information glut. And what we don't have is wisdom to hear God's voice. Hmm. Another definition is a picture of things seen, intended to reveal and explain things unseen. That's just what happened to me. There's a great tragedy in blindness. Fanny Crosby, who was, had as a little baby, the medicine was put into her eyes to heal her, and it ruined her eyesight. She became blind. Can you imagine the encounter that mother had with the doctor and the father? What have you done? She lived 90 years and wrote over 8,000 hymns. And they ask her, how do you feel about living your whole life blind? That tragic accident, that uh, doctor, sincere, but put the wrong salve in your eyes and burned your eyeballs and you never saw again. She says, oh, I hate to think what I would have missed if I had not been blind. <laughs> because God gave her spiritual eyes. And what a parable is doing, spiritual things mean nothing to those who have only natural understanding. Even when they hear them, they don't understand them. It's like asking a horse or a cat, what do you think of the sunset? They don't understand. The question today, do you have natural understanding about the things of God or do you have spiritual understanding? And Jesus is saying here, there are four types of responses to what I say. Notice he explains it down in verse, uh, if you would, in verse 18. Listen as I explain to you what's going on. The parable of the sower, what does it mean? When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in his heart. And this is the seed sown along the path. Some seed falls along the path. And here's the point. Notice what it says. You don't understand, but instead of trying to understand, you let Satan come and steal it away. I call these the dense hearers of the word. Are you a dense hearer today? You'll hear a truth but you won't follow it up. Someone will say something about how wonderful the Bible is. You say, oh, that's right, I need to read the Bible more. But you never do it. We talk a minute about the wonder of prayer and how, like David McClinton, to hear his voice this morning so strong and vital, just praising God for the prayers of our people, wow, that puts something into me. Are you too dense not to really respond to that? Satan steals it away somehow. 
Well, there's a second thing to notice. The one who receives the seed that fell in the rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. Hallelujah, hot dog, I'm all for it. But since there's no root, he lasts only a short time. Why does he last only a short time? Because trouble or persecution comes and he quickly falls away. Now, if the first folks are dense, these second folks are distracted. They're so distracted by problems that they can't really focus on the promise. Like Adrian Rogers always said about David when he went against, Eli against Goliath, he was standing there and everyone else said that Goliath is too big to fight. And David said, no, he's too big to miss. <laughs> Total different insight about things. He wasn't distracted by how big his problem was because he focused on the Lord. And there's some of us here today, some of you here today, who are letting your problems be bigger than God's promises. Now, if that isn't distraction, I don't know what is. I prayed with one of our members recently, and there's a tumor, a benign tumor, but it could take your life. One of the leaders of this church back in 65, Dr. Glenn Clayton, found out in his early 50s he had a tumor on his brain stem, inoperable, that wasn't even malignant. But he killed him because it grew bigger and bigger and cut off the stem. And this member of our church has that same problem, and we prayed. And one of the things the Lord led me to pray, but, but you say, well, Pastor, what do you pray about all the time? I don't know. I just, God, give me the words. And I said, Lord Jesus, let my dear sister here know that you're bigger than her tumor. And I prayed that when we finished it. Big tears around. God is bigger than your problem. Don't let your problem distract you. Pastor Brown, you had a great article about our, about our prayer folks this week. You quoted Spurgeon. Of course, you always do well if you quote someone great. But it was tremendous, Marty. And uh, uh, he quoted Dr. Spurgeon who said, Those of us who have plunged the deepest in the ocean of suffering have found the greatest pearl. Boy, that's terrific. Don't let your pain and your problem distract you from God's promises. Go deep. Praise God for the pressures. Praise God for the battles. Praise God for the pain. Not because it's painful and not because it's the battle, not because you lose someone you love, but you praise because God has promised whatever happens to you, if you keep obeying me, it's going to bring glory to me, good to you, and bless those you love. Do you believe it? Yes, is what the Lord would tell us here. Don't be distracted. There's the third thing. Notice that. The one who receives the seed that is among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it and make it unfruitful. Well, I hate to say it, but these are those who are deceived. You're either dense, distracted, or deceived. These folks are not dense. They're smart. These are the business people. They're not distracted. Boy, they're really focused. Problem is they're letting Satan focus them on the wrong thing. If each of these folks were to talk, you'd talk to the dense person, he'd say, well, I know I need to go to church more. they say, what's the big problem in your life? Well, I need to go to church more. Well, boy, that's ridiculous. That's like saying you have cancer and all you need to do is go to the doctor more. <laughs> going to the doctors more is not going to help your cancer unless the doctor has something to say that you apply, unless it's a treatment. Coming to church more isn't the answer to your problems. Giving more money isn't the answer to your problems. Even writing a big check for HPOV is not your problem. The problem is being dense about what God wants to do to change your life. The folks who were distracted here, you know, they would make the statement, well, I'm going to try harder. Let me give you then to write this down. Never say, I'm going to try harder. Because no matter how hard you try, it's not good enough. And there's a shame, and we Christians are guilty of this. Uh, we will try to get Christians to do more, recommit, rededicate, and all the rest of that stuff. But man, if you try harder, two things are going to happen, and both of them are bad. 
first of all, if you try real hard and fail, you'll get discouraged. And how many of us have done that? I know when I became a new Christian, I decided I was going to live a perfect day. I'd just turn over a new leaf every day. Man, I turned over so many new leaves, I felt like Sherwood Forest, <laughs> and it never did me any good. And then if you try and have a little bit of success, you're going to get proud. That's no good either. Write down, try harder, and then cross it out and say never again. You see, I checked this out in the, in the New Testament before I said this today, but there's not one place in the Bible where it says you and I as Christians are supposed to rededicate or recommit ourselves to Christ. And how many times have we heard that? I'm thankful as I discovered this. You know, I look back on the 32 years I've been here. I know some of you have talked to me, why don't we have really hard-hitting altar calls here? There's always been something in me that's kind of pulled back from trying to get you to rededicate your dead flesh. Recommit your sorry effort. The deal that we need to do and what the Bible talks about all the time, if we're going to follow Christ, we just yield to what he tells us to do. Then he does it all. And I checked my notes from a year ago last fall when I talked about this great principle. I know we need to go over them again, that what every one of us needs is a revelation from God. Remember that? There's not a single one of you over on my left or way over on my right or in the orchestra or in the choir. There's not a single one of us here today that God does not want to give you a personal revelation to, of himself as to what you need to do. You don't need to try. You just have to hear what he says and do it. Yield yourselves unto God. Now, I don't want to get off into that. That's another 30-minute digression. I tell my class over at uh, OBU, I said, now, we chased a rabbit, but that rabbit had a lot of meat on it, right? Oh, yeah. A lot of meat on this. And that's why many of us here today, we are, as we said here, we're, we're deceived by thinking that we're going to do something. And it's what Christ has already done within us. Like last week, he's taken, as I said last week, he's taken our sins and hurled them into the bottom of the sea. That means you don't have a past when it comes to living for God today. And you say, well, what about my sins last month? Well, they've already been dealt with. God knew that anyway. Well, how about the results? of? Well, some of those results will come along. Just because God forgives you and gives you a new start today doesn't mean you're not going to suffer some of the consequences of what's past. But those consequences are past, create new consequences today. In fact, I will never forget the moment that God said, H, take all your past sins and all your stupid mistakes and all your miserable misdirections and detractions and deviations and use every one of them, throw them into a big heap and burn them as a new fuel to follow me. Every day is new in the Lord Jesus Christ. And some of us are so dense, we cannot see it. God wants to do something in you today. As I think about our church, praying about this church, the three things, Pastor Ho, thank you for that note on save, save, save. Let's always be sure we put it in that way, would you? I tell you, that Kent's a fast learner. What are the three things that I want most for this fellowship? It's what I'm dedicating myself for. In fact, uh, as long as I'm thinking about it, I didn't know I'd use this today, but I'm reading a little book here called A Tale of Three Virtues. Now, actually, if it had been The Tale of Four Virtues, I wouldn't have bought it. Uh, but here's my goal. I wrote it down. You'll see it. I'll put it in print. I wrote it at the top of the book. UBC, to create a community of people who powerfully display a fervent devotion to Jesus Christ and whose amazing servant lives. Wow, I love that whose amazing servant lives can be explained only in terms of supernatural love. Do you want to be a part of something like that? Or do you want to be some old dead religious Baptist who shows up on Sunday and says you believe a few things? See, we've not been called to follow a way, to follow a doctrine, to build a denomination. We've been called to respond to a person. <laughs> wow, that puts excitement into it, doesn't it? And so my great vision, what do I want? Oh, number one, Lord Jesus Christ, help me do my little part, whatever it is, to beg you, to plead with you, to beseech you, develop an intimacy with Jesus Christ. Know him, love him, adore him, talk to him, listen to him, praise him. That's what I beg of you, for you. 
And Lord, help me make it plain. Let me do my little part, whatever it is in this church, to try to lead men and women who may listen to me to have an intimacy, a daily devotion. Husbands, that's what you need to do in your family more than anything else. Forget spending more time with the kids or more time with the wife or taking more money home or taking more vacation, not spending enough time with the business. You can do all that and still miss it until you can share with your wife an intimacy with Jesus Christ. The second thing, evangelism. Boy, there was a time when I first became pastor here that I personally led someone to Christ almost every week for the first 10 years I was here. I feel I've become some kind of religious freak that all I do is show up at the church, you know, and do my business. And I'm asking the Lord Jesus to restore in my heart and in all of us a passion to win people to Jesus Christ, to fill this place. We're not bad this morning, are we? Still have some seats around. I hate to think of the time we'll go back to two services again. So, no, I don't want evangelism. I just keep it like it is. I will do it. The third thing. Oh, I pray about this, and this you'll hear it. You're going to hear a lot more about it. Our disciple community division, where we develop an intimacy with one another. This thing is so big, I can't touch it. I'm just praying that every Sunday school class, every committee, every time you all meet to sing in the choir, there'll be someone there that loves you, or the orchestra. I look over this great crowd today. And boy, I know more of the problems in this room than anyone else here. You say, why do you talk the way you do? You ought to know what I do about everybody sitting in here today. And I just almost have a brokenness. Oh, God, want someone to love you. Want someone to care for you. Want someone to help you, see. And it's not this little old cat. I'm just one little preacher. But all of us need to have the ability to be on spiritual mission. Every one of you ought to have a vision to matter spiritually to the people you know. One of the little mottos I've tried to develop here is that Jesus Christ never called anyone, hey, you. He knows every one of us by our names. And every time any of you walk through that door or walk out or anyone else does a stranger, I pray, oh God, may someone walk up to them. What's your name? I'm so-and-so. God bless you. A God who cares cannot be represented by people who don't. Don't be deceived. Don't be distracted. Don't be dense. The Lord finally told me that's what the D in my name standed for, stood for, dummy. <laughs> because it takes me so long to catch on with what the Christ is really up to. Now, notice that fourth. But the fourth seed, what was it? It fell on good soil, the man who's hungry, who hears the word and understands it and produces. In other words, he does something about it. Thirty, sixty, a hundred. Oh, I love that. Thirty, sixty, a hundred. We have some thirty people in here today. You're limited in your gifts, in your talent, in your ability, and you'll never produce more than about 30-fold. Some of us in here have a few more gifts, a little more money. We'll never produce more than about 60-fold. And some will produce 100. It doesn't make any difference so long as you produce to your maximum. None of us really know how much we can produce. What we need to do is just do it. Now, the Lord Jesus is asked by the disciples here in verse uh, 10, the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? Now, let me tell you quick because it's important. First of all, Jesus said in verse 11, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom have been given to you but not to them. He reveals himself to the hungry. That's number one. Jesus doesn't want to throw his truth out to someone who's not hungry for it. David McClinton, when he called me this morning, there he is struggling in his life and death struggle. You still pray for him. He, we could still lose him. But he said, oh, pastor, he's in isolation. He said, this morning the Lord gave me Psalm 90. Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for the joy and be glad in all of our days. Make us glad for the many days as you have afflicted us for the many years, we have seen trouble. Thank God we see trouble because only trouble makes us see God. 
May our deeds be shown to your servant, your splendor to their children. Isn't that beautiful? You see, God speaks to us in parables because we're hungry. God says more to the hungry than he does the unhungry. And one of the ways to mark a church is it hungry or not. How hungry are you for the things of God? You're more hungry for other things. Secondly, notice in uh, verse uh, uh, 12, he says, whoever has will be given more and whoever does not have abundance and who doesn't have anything will be taken away. He wants to teach the Father's principles. Now, what is this? That God says, hey, you got a thousand, I'm going to give you two. You have a hundred, I'm going to take your hundred away. No, no, no. If you understand the text, it means whoever realizes what he has and uses it will have more. Whoever doesn't realize what he has and doesn't use it will have less. Very simple. That's why we beg you every Sunday. That's why I look to the Lord and say, oh, Lord, help me give more and more of myself to you. Because the Lord says, the more I give to him, the more I get. The less I give to him, the less I get. That's a great principle. The Lord says, I have principles here that need to be observed. The next thing, he exposes their need. Notice verse 13. This is why I speak in parables. Though seeing, they don't see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. Some people will never get it. I'm amazed. I've had people in my office for 32 years have all kinds of problems, and as I look back on it now, I think one, one thing would sum it up. You just don't get it, do you? That Jesus Christ wants to be Lord of your life, and unless he is, you're always going to have problems you can't solve. The fourth reason he spoke in parables was to fulfill the Scripture in verse 14. And then the last reason in verse 16, to be blessed because your eyes have seen what the prophets never saw, to empower you with joy. That's why the parables were given. Probably need to print that up. I know I gave those five very quickly, but here's what I want to close with. Here's what I want to close with. How do we see the kingdom? Thank God for your plowed heart. You have big problems today. Hallelujah. Some of you who are dense or distracted and deceived need to have a few more problems so you'll become devoted, which is the fourth one. See, devoted to producing what you can produce. And here's a story, the parable I want to close with. I came up with this just a few weeks ago. Didn't, I did not come up with it, but I read it, a true story. See if this won't tickle your heart A mother, of course, was very grieved because she had lost her husband. The whole family were sailors. And the husband had been lost at sea, drowned. She hated the fact that her other two boys were sailors too, but couldn't do anything about it. And so her oldest son went on a journey. He was to return in three months. This is a sailing ship back in the days of the sailing ships in England. And it had been a year and he had not returned. So she had lost her second son. She had one son left who was in the life-saving business there. He went out on the lifeboats to try to rescue sailors who floundered and crashed in their boats uh, sank off the seacoast, and they would try to go save them. Well, during a terrible storm, he went out in a lifeboat to save some people in a boat. His mother said, oh, honey, don't go. I've already lost my husband. I've lost your brother. Do you have to go? Mother, I have to go. And so the son went out and, with the captain, and they filled the lifeboat, got everyone but one man, and brought them back to shore. And all had been saved except the one man they couldn't reach because he'd been blown overboard. He was holding on to a rope. And so her son and the captain said, we need to go back again. And the mother said, oh, honey, don't, please. Please, please. I've lost your dad. I've lost your brother named Will, not my grandson. I've lost your brother, my other son named Will, and now I don't want to lose you. Mother, I have to go. Please, son, please don't go. Mother, I have to go. So she went back to her house just distraught in tears and prayer as her last son went into an almost hopeless situation to save a man they didn't even know. And the young brother went out with the captain. They made it to the ship. They found the man. They put him on the boat. They rowed back in. 
And when they landed exhausted, fell over in the beach, all the younger brother could do was look up at the people who rushed and said, tell mother that I made it back and that the man we saved was well. Her own son, oldest son, who'd been lost a year, she thought, was coming back on that boat. And if she had had her way and kept her son from risking his life, she would have lost the son she had now restored. If we limit our risk, we limit our potential. And there's some of you God is calling to risk your time, risk your treasure, risk your talent, risk your truth on building a great witness for Jesus Christ in this place. Because even though you risk it, you risk your children, you may not know this, but what you risk may save your wife, save your son, save your daughter, save your grandchildren. How do you see the kingdom? You risk your hungry heart to the seeds of God's truth and obey it. Oh, what a challenge we have ahead of us. God help us these next months and years that we might have together to introduce the kingdom of our wonderful, blessed, precious Christ to others, but not just to us that we may know it with fresh wonder ourselves.